compared to case managers in Part B, but we are communicating so often across agency lines. And so the communication log is a wonderful tool for you to use to document not only those really meaningful conversations and communications you have with family members, but also the communications that you might have with your public health, social service, Head Start, ECFE colleagues. And so the communication log is found under other forms and logs. And when you open it up, it gives you a drop down of what's the, you know, who are you communicating with and what is their relationship to the student um, for who's, on whose behalf you are communicating. And you'll see the list of options that show up in SPED forms. I would really encourage you to review what shows up for you. And if the things that in early intervention you would like to see included aren't there, like Head Start or Child Care or ECFE colleague, you can certainly ask your district administrator to create some additional drop downs that are available within your district that are not um, currently SPED forms options. Um, within the, the communication log, there is a place to document um, who is the, who are you contacting, who's, you know, their phone number, that basic contact information, the reason for initiating the contact, a place for notes from the conversation, and then the contact method. Was it a phone call? Was it an email? Was it a, you had a face-to-face? -face? But it's any of those communication opportunities that you would like to document. Again, the person icon shows up there. So if it's someone who you've taken the time to put in your team member list, all of those contacts, all of this information will fill in, you know, at least the top information will fill in automatically with just a click. Once you've got those communications in there, you're also able to search your communication log. So, you know, for example, if you're thinking, oh, I know I talked to the public health nurse you know, about Fitzwilliam, and I just got to remember, what was it she said? I could search for that contact. I could search for my public health nurse. I could, I think, oh boy, I know it was between, oh, it was last spring sometime, sometime between March and the end of the school year. I could put in those search dates and help me zero in to find what was that communication log entry that I made specific to that individual and this child. Um, it's important to remember that the communication log transfers with the student. So I think as early intervention professionals, we are always positive when we're communicating with families and others, but just making sure that you remember that your this contact log does transfer with the student to another SPED forms district. Periodic review, we're going to touch on this briefly, and there's one new thing that's coming regarding the periodic review. So this is... Um, the IFSP menu, and it is called Progress Report. So know that this is the periodic review form. And remember that an IFSP must be reviewed at least every six months. And so, you know, in a perfect world, we'd hold an IFSP, you know, we'd write the IFSP on January 1st. You know, six months later, we'd hold a periodic review. Six months later, we'd hold the annual review. So we've got all those at least every six month reviews. If for a, a family or child related reason, you know, we write the plan in January and we need to meet in April because something's changed and we're going to add a service or change something significant, then the next review has to be within six months. We can't wait until the next January. So just know that it's, we're reviewing every six months. So this is that progress reporting document. And if you have an IFSP that's been finalized in SPED forms, your, your outcome statements will pop in there automatically. And there's a place then for you to identify whether or not you're going to continue the outcome, whether it was accomplished, whether you're going to modify it in some way. Um, so it's just that wonderful place for you to document where kids are at at that, you know, that at least every six month interval. Um, so this is what that looks like in its entirety. There is a checkbox that's down at the bottom that says copy from most recent progress report. So this is within the IFSP itself. So if you fill out the progress review document, you can insert that information right into the body of the plan if that's um, your district's preference. 
One of the things I mentioned that something new was coming, um, Spedworms is creating what is called a standalone periodic review. And it is for those kids who move into your district and their IFSP was created by a district that didn't doesn't use sped forms or maybe they moved in from out of state with an IFSP that you're able to implement it allows you conduct to conduct a periodic review without the requirement that the child and family outcomes are moving in from a finalized sped forms plan so that is something new um, that was created in response to all of the districts that have come to sped forms recently from student plans when student plans decided to no longer um, exist as a due process software package. Um, also required by for service coordinators, this other big responsibility that you have is to facilitate the development of a transition plan, whether it's a plan to preschool, to school, or if appropriate to other services. And so the IFSP in that transition plan must include the steps and services from Part C either to preschool services under Part B. And you'll see I've crossed out Part C services under 303.211. That's a, what's called the Part C extended option. Um, and it's something that Minnesota has chosen not to implement. And so for Minnesota, it's transition to preschool services under Part B or other appropriate services. And this is the um, what is required federally in terms of transition that it, it the um, steps and services that need to be documented in the IFSP include discussion with and training of parents as appropriate regarding future placements, procedures to prepare the child for changes in service delivery, and the identification of transition services and other activities that the IFSP determines are necessary. And so SPED forms within the IFSP document, the transition section captures that. One of the important first steps that each IFS team, IFSP team has to take when the child um, is in that transition window is to determine is the child potentially eligible for services under Part B or not. Um, and so it also provides an opportunity to document for those kids that are determined to be professionally el or potentially eligible have you already established eligibility? So have you done a simultaneous C and B evaluation and established that initial eligibility? And the reason that's critical is if you've determined that the child is indeed potentially eligible for Part B, then the transition conference requirement kicks in, which isn't required for kids that are not potentially Part B eligible. So I'm just going to emphasize this is not required for children younger than two years, three months. It's for those kids in the transition window. So you don't have to decide when a child is born, is this child potentially eligible? You can wait until two years, three months. It's just that has to be determined before the child is two years, nine months, so you can meet the transition requirements. Okay, so coordinating transition. If the child is potentially eligible, and remember, you've got the I, your, this is an IFSP or a child served through an IFSP, in this potentially eligible under Part B folder, all of the documents that are typically used to establish initial eligibility under Part B are provided for you so that you don't have to be flipping fat back and forth between the IFSP and IEP um, drop down on the top of the, the forms menu. It just puts them all there for you. It also puts um, for you a special folder of required forms for those kids that have been in service in Minnesota under Part C for six months or more. So it's those accountability requirements of the child outcome summary form, the family outcome survey, and the cover letter that is associated with the survey. So those things are there for you. So again, for you and you as Part C service coordinators are the one managing those critical activities that are part of transition. Documentation in the IFSP itself, an initial evaluation for service under Part B for those kids that are potentially eligible, and then the accountability components for those kids that have been served in Minnesota for six months or more. So SPED Forms makes all of those things easy for you because they're all served up in really intuitive ways. The Child Outcome Summary Form has been 2.0, and there are a few things that I 
believe will be, we're, we're bringing the Child Outcome Summary Form to the SPED Forms ECSC Advisory Board for some review and input, but I just want to share with you what's there currently so you can, you know, everything that you need is there, we just want to make it a little more intuitive. So when you go into the Early Childhood Outcomes Summary Form tab on, in the Forms menu, it gives you multiple pages to be completed. So the first one is um, the child uh, the child information page, and you have to decide what is the purpose of the rating. Is it entrance to Part C, exit from Part C, also exit to Part B? So for some kids, you're going to check both of those, exit from C, entrance to B, or is it just exit from preschool special ed? And one of the things that we'll, we will be adding to this form is a place to put the date of the entrance or exit event. Right now, it, it captures the date of the form, so the date that, the, that you've made the COS rating, knowing that kids show up on your list from MDE based on the day they entered. So if they entered in June and you've just gotten to know the child and you're completing that entry COS now, you want to make sure that that kid shows up on the report for the correct fiscal year. If you do it now for a kid that technically entered in June, um, without being able to backdate it, you're, you're not going to get the kid in the right reporting year. So we're going to try to make that easier and more intuitive moving forward. Um, the COS form itself, there is a page for each of the three outcomes, as there always have been. Um, Things have been re-spaced a little bit, and so as, as you are completing this or you, if you are in a coordinator or administrative role and you're helping your staff complete this, just remind them that um, you know, to, to really be looking at that decision tree document to better understand how those these questions, when answered, feed into the correct one to seven rating. So this first question, does the child ever function in ways that would be considered age appropriate with regard to this outcome? You need to think about the authentic assessment tools and what that you're using with the child, what you've learned about a child through the initial evaluation process. If it's an entry rating, what you've learned during the period of early intervention, if it's an exit rating. And if you answer yes to this, then you know this child is gonna be a four, five, six, or seven because you said, yep, there's some age expected skills here. If you said no, then we know the child is going to be a one, two, or three. And so you have to very carefully follow the sequence of questions. So if you said no, it's telling you to go to question 2A. If you've said yes, then you go to question 2B. And so anytime you are you are going through this form that you get to a question where, like if you say no, it gives it says then there's a rating. Once you hit that rating cue, then you know you can quit. You, you've completed everything you need to complete, except if it's an entrance and you have to, or an exit, and you have to answer whether or not the child has shown any new skills. So this is where you would answer yes or no, the child has or has not um, gained any new skills since the initial entrance. The spacing of these questions makes it a little less intuitive than the COS, than the Child Outcome Summary Form that was part of version one. So just really be looking for what is, and I'll actually give you an example of um, kind of what I'm talking about here. In question, um, oh, maybe I haven't captured it on the screen. Where this this one that's question two B does the child's functioning or age appropriate? It where you've got two places to document things. It's I'm not on the live site, so it's not letting me show you exactly. But you just really want to watch for those um, pieces where the the question has two. If you answer yes or no, it has two different places to do the documentation, and it's not immediately intuitive that both text fields are tied to the same question. So I really take a look at the new layout. Once you're used to it, I think it'll it'll feel just like the old layout, but it looks just a, it looks and feels just a little bit different than the COS form did in 1.0. And then um, the final page of this is for kids at exit who have a hearing loss. 
and it captures all of the data that the Department of Education collects on behalf of the Department of Health for reporting as part of their early hearing detection and intervention initiative. And so we've worked to make sure that the questions and the code set is exactly like um, what MDE is asking you for. So that when this information that you enter gets pulled into the report that you can generate from um, within SPED forms, it'll make it much easier for whoever does the actual data entry to get this information um, to MDE in a way that's accurate and complete. Talk briefly about educator reports. We've got just a couple of minutes and I just want you to know that they're here. So you can access educator reports, again, under your hamburger menu. So the, the reports themselves look just a little bit different, but when you go in there, this is what the searchable reports look like. There are also quick reports. Um, so this is the, the list that you see on your screen right now is the searchable reports. And when within those searchable reports, you get to do some filtering as you're creating the reports. So if you are an educator, you can pull a combined report, it's called, that shows students that you plan manage or um, students that have been shared with me if you also want those. Um, you can put in um, a few additional data elements. You can create a time parameter as you're creating your combined report. And these are the data elements that get pulled into the combined report. So if you are one of those people who at the start of the year create a spreadsheet of things for you know specific to the kids that you serve or that you are the service coordinator for, this will give you a jump start on that spreadsheet that you might always create just because anything that you pull out of a combined report can be um, exported as an Excel document for then you to manipulate and add additional data to if you so choose. Um, a couple of the things that you might want to know are there. One is um, which kids have progress reports in student history so that if there are any that you've missed, it helps you become more aware of those. Um, a really lovely new feature with quick reports is that you can create a favorites list. So one of the things that you can do within the, I'm in the quick reports tab and up at the top, there is a search field. And so I've just put in part C and it's identified for me three um, quick reports that have part C in the title of the quick report. So those might be things that I want to have show up at the top of my list when I go into quick reports. And all I have to do to make that happen is you see the little stars? I can check, click the stars, they show yellow on the screen, and then they will always show up at the top of my quick reports list. So those things that are most important to me as a teacher, most important to me as an administrator, become part of my quick reports favorites list. Um, these are some possible, really popular quick reports for um, early childhood. And you can see there's a list of kids birth to three, kids birth to four. You can generate mailing labels. Um, the ECSEs uh, for screening and evaluation form we talked about that it pulls in that referral and evaluation and screening information. You can pull a report on um, IFSP 45 day timelines. You can pull up kids whose peer, you know six month review is due within 30 days. Um, you can identify those IFSPs that include joint home visits. You can pull up who on my list was qualified using informed clinical opinion if at a district level that's something of interest. Um, and again, this is what that looks like when I've highlighted my favorites. So all of the things that I'm most interested in as an early intervention service provider now show up at the very top of my quick reports list. So I might not have to search quite so hard in the future. My favorite things are there. And I think that's where we're going to stop. And um, we've got a few minutes for any questions that remain. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see.